Welcome to Shopify Masters, the podcast powered by Shopify. And welcome to the Bush Bomb mini series. My name is Shwang Esther Shan. I am one of the hosts of Shopify Masters. And I am David Gaylord, Shopify's merchant in residence and the co-founder of Bush Bomb. Welcome back to this mini series. Today, we're diving in to all things finances. Yeah, the most exciting topic that we might have, <laughs> or the most boring, some might say. For sure, but I think a very crucial one, um, and definitely an area a lot of business owners um, needs help on. So, David, for you guys, initially when you started Bush Bomb, how much did you individually contribute to the business? So in the first kind of, when we first kicked off, we all put in a very small amount. I forget what it was. I think it was like 200 and something, $76 or something like that, all three of us put in. Um, so it was really a small, small amount. And that money was to simply get product. So just to get enough product as well as, I think it was to pay for our domain name and a few other things. But we wanted to start with a tiny assortment product. And our investment wasn't to make a huge company. Our investment was just to see if the idea worked and if people would buy it, if people enjoyed the product. So the investment for us early on was just to see if it would work and could we do it very small that it would be if we lost a thousand dollars. You know, we learned a lot from it. That's kind of the, that's how we exactly started with finances. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I think a lot of business start this way. Your friend, your coworker, you have an idea, you set things up. At what point did you guys take this seriously and say, oh, we kind of need like a banking account. We probably need to move things into something separate than our personal accounts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that took uh, like the first year we, we didn't do very many sales. We did uh, about $3,200, I think it was, or $3,600. So very, very small. Um, and at that point, it's it's so it's very easy to manage. Um, income is so low from it. Uh, even your credit card, like if you're putting money on it, it's easy to pay yourself back. Like nothing is too complicated. Um, and then in year two, we, we started to do more sales. Year three, we I think we were at $150,000 in sales. And at that point, we thought, okay, we're starting to actually have money flow through the business into kind of new inventory, Facebook ads. And at one point, we thought, okay, we should really talk to a bank to not only make it organized and easier to run, but also we're, we need to build up our credit history with a bank. Um, and that's kind of so old school to say, but building up your credit history with a bank um, often with a small business account, if you're brand new, they'll say, oh, your credit card limit is whatever it is. But if you've been there for two years and you've paid off your credit card for two years, they'll say, you know what, hey, yeah, we can raise it a little bit. We can change it to this. We can change to that. Um, so once we started to say, hey, this is kind of a real business making uh, a few investments in growing, um, we moved it all there. And it helps so much on just organizing everything, um, my credit card wasn't constantly at like ten thousand dollar limit for Facebook ads or all the ads. Um, I lost the ability to get points personally, but um, I think that's worth it now. That's interesting to hear because it did take a while. You were saying year three, and then also it was the point where you guys hit six figures in sales. So that's when you guys like swapped over to business accounts and business credit cards. Yeah, exactly. It, we probably should have done it a little bit earlier, to be honest. Um, but yeah, it made a big difference for kind of organizing everything. And there's so many ho horror stories about banking in general. And we, we went through one with our, um, our old bank who we moved away from, but we signed up with them at that, say, $100,000 a year mark. Um, and then we went to $150,000 the next year. But then the next year, which was uh, about a year and a half ago, we did uh, almost $2 million in sales. So what happened was we went to our banking partner at one point and we said, hey, we were selling so much that our bank account and our line of credit and everything is just not sufficient anymore. Can we increase our credit card? Can we increase our line of credit? Can we increase like whatever's available? And they were like, oh no, you don't have enough history with the bank. We can't increase it. And that was like the first time I'd ever been like so frustrated by a system, not making any sense because literally every day the money would flow into our bank account in their bank 
and then our ad spend would go onto our credit card and then we'd pay it off and it would the cycle would continue and it got to the point where I had to fully pay off our credit card um, just to keep our ad account from going shutting off from not paying the bill so you get like you get no benefits of a credit card because you you, know, you can't pay it in 30 days I literally had to pay it every single day um, whereas working with our new banking partner we went in, hey, here's our financials, here's where we're at, here's how we scaled. And they said, baseline, here's where we'll start you, which was like 10 times bigger in credit than the first the first bank we were with. And the first bank, the reason we couldn't get the line of credit because we didn't have enough history. Whereas the new bank said, you know what? Yeah, you have your sales history. We see it. Like, it's fine. And we'll we'll scale. So some banks obviously are, are different. Um, but yeah, having the ability to get capital from a bank um, is really efficient if you have the available credit. Whereas if you don't, it's it's really challenging. Mm-hmm. I also want to point out, it's like a lot of times business, we talk about operational logistics, um, mostly meaning the supply chain, but I feel like there's also that financial logistics and like the financial pieces moving around. That's very complicated. It is complicated. And also like understanding cash flow is is a bit of a challenge for many small businesses because you're not maybe not an expert in finances or cash flow. So l- luckily, I have a good a partner in the business who a lot of his role is on the financial side. Um, but yeah, in the early days, we were all kind of doing it um, together, and it's actually funny. There's there's ways to be more efficient with just like how you move money around and how you pay bills and how you do these things. Whereas a lot of your standard banking accounts um, and business bank accounts don't have options for certain things. So a funny example was last year at the at the peak of COVID, we were growing so fast and we had to buy inventory so fast. And I do remember it was like right when COVID in North America was really spreading and like everyone was shutting down, things were locked down, everything. And I physically had to go for five days in a row to our local bank to send a wire transfer. I had to walk in and they asked me the questions. They were turning people away who could do it online and other places. But I had to physically do it in person and sign and do all these things. And then after that five days in a row, the following week I came back, I had to do another wire. It was just the time I had to do to do these things was so... I had to drive there. It was like an hour to do it every single time at least. They said, oh, for I think it was $24 a month, I can get a platform and I can just do it from home. And it took a week and a half for them to tell me that option. And I was so frustrated because I thought $24 a month to save how much time? Like that's incredible. So yeah, there's tools to just make things more efficient and payroll and all the things you might have to do, um, which isn't intense or anything. It's just like knowing these tools exist to make your life easier. And also just like goes to show you that, yeah, there's logistics with finances that would help run your business smoother. Um, I do wanted to ask about, you know, your partnership with Tim. You guys are friends and you guys are coworkers before. A lot of the times people say, you know, friendship and finances and money don't mix. How did you guys, you know, approach like we are going into business together and now like there's finances involved. Did you guys ever draft like an agreement ever or how did you guys approach this area? Yeah, so there's a lot of things. Um, like we we are obviously have like our shareholders agreement and all of that. Um, and then when you sign with the bank, there's all these agreements you have. Um, we're incorporated, so there's there's even more there. Um, but one thing for us that we we said was pretty important was let's sort out our just like how we how we do work, right? So being very clear with what you do for your role w- was important for us as a partnership. And actually, in the early days, Tim uh, Tim's wife Mel was was heavily involved. So we had it set up to do. Uh, I'm going to run this, and we're very specific about what what that that is. Tim is going to run this, and we're very specific about that. And then Mel is going to run this. So the more specific we were, the easier things were in regards to expectations and and how we actually get everything done. 
And if there was any sort of gap, it was more obvious because, hey, no one owns this. Who's going to do that? And then we'd say, oh, okay, I can do it or you can do it. Um, and that, that isn't directly related to finances, but what it does is it makes it so it's very specific for who's going to do which, which thing. And it becomes a little more fair in that way and leads to obviously less disputes, less people upset. Um, so for us, yeah, just making sure there's clear uh, roles and responsibilities is important for the partnership. Um, and then on the finance side, um, we do a lot of reporting, kind of monthly reporting on the finances, how we're doing, where spend is going, that kind of thing, um, which keeps us, I would say, really in line with uh, how we're growing the business. For the different stages of growth, you know, you mentioned your three six figures, um, last year, multi-million in sales. At which point have you thought about external fundraising and what efforts have you guys taken for those fundraising times? So we've we've thought about fundraising in, in many ways um, at many points in the business. And right now we are solely, uh, or bootstrapped the whole thing. And uh, But last year, last summer in August, we actually uh, signed up and we got accepted and we went on Dragon's Den. So at that point, we were on pace to do about $2 million, um, in the year. And we went on there with a uh, fair valuation. We, we thought our pitch was was great. Um, they saw the value in the company and saw the, the valuation is really fair. So we actually did get a, a deal on Dragon's Den. Um, and that would have been, imagine the year is $2 million in sales. So some people raised money at that point. Um, and we thought maybe... If we get money, we, it would be a good idea and we could put it into this investment or that investment. Um, so anyways, we, we went on the show, got a deal. It was excellent. We had great publicity from it. Um, the, the partner was Arlene, who we got a deal with. Um, so the process is you obviously work very hard in your pitch. Um, and this is for any sort of investing. Say we were to raise money elsewhere, same thing. You've got to build a compelling pitch to show why you're worth a certain valuation, but also the opportunity and the upside. So I think on Dragon's End, we did a great job of that. On the show, you, you see some of it, but there's you're kind of in the room for about almost an hour and a half pitching through your business. So it's a lot longer than the seven-minute episode you see. Um, and then there is the piece of, yeah, deals accepted, great. Handshake, whatever it is. Let's go into due diligence. So with uh, our Dragon's End deal, we, we went into due diligence and um, – one thing for any investor or any investor, but also any business owner is before due diligence and before the pitch, the key element of yourself and your business is make sure one, your finances are so solid. If you have really clean finances, everything's in order, you're going through all the processes, that will make obviously knowing the data for your pitch, knowing your profit margins for your pitch, all of those so much easier. But also, when you go into due diligence, it's quick. You're going to send it over. Here's our op. Here's our balance sheet. Here's our profit margins. Here's all this. They will love that. So that's that's one. And then the second is being really tightly organized. So if you are running your business now, you should really have all of your agreements organized in folders, all of your employment agreements, um, all of your contracts. Um, all of your financials from the last three years, four years, every quarter, your monthly statements, you should all have that set aside and, and made in folders. So if you do go to raise money or you go on Dragon's Den or any of those shows, it's quick and due diligence. You pop that over, you say, here's what they think, here's what we got. So luckily, we were really organized going into Dragon's Den. It made it really helpful. We understood our data, our numbers. And then due diligence for us, we sent everything over. It was pretty quick to get uh, get back and forth and discuss. Um the hard part with a fast growing business is during kind of negotiations, we were growing so fast that our valuation at some points, we thought, okay, we're, we're growing faster and it's been a month and a half, two months. Our valuation might actually be much higher now. And by the end of it, it was for sure the case of, hey, our valuation is probably $2 million more. So we have to really start fresh on this um, as well as the terms of any sort of agreement. Um, if you're going through the due diligence phase, really get a lawyer or work with business people that you trust. And there are certain things that you'll want to understand uh, really carefully, uh, whether whatever the terms are, whether it's board seating, 
um, how they want you to use the proceeds, say re- monthly reporting they expect to see from you. Um, you should read the fine details because in the end, those will be really important. So anyways, long story short, our, our Dragon's End deal uh, actually never went through um, kind of for some of those those reasons. Um, and looking back, it might have been the best scenario for us um, because – we quickly grew this year to $10 million. So kind of evaluation earlier on a, a year before, um, that was much, much lower than what, what it would be now. Um, so we bootstrapped and figured out how to wait, ways to get finances in. And the best thing for us now, or earlier to get finances in, was we found that new banking partner who our line of credit was five times more. Our credit card, I think, was 10 times more. Um, so we were able to, to bootstrap the business um, really efficiently that way. Um, but yeah, I guess one thing, Shwang, if we want to get into is um, just on the side of actually raising money, because um, that's we, we haven't done it, but I'm in the process right now of, uh, of going through the early phases of, say, those pitching calls. Yeah, I feel like there's so much to unpack here, but if we would just go back a step, I think going to Dragon Scent or whichever angel investor or VC firm, um, and you're trying to prepare for valuation, um, I think especially for anyone who's checking this episode out, they'll hear, you know, you were on uh, par or on the process of projecting $2 million in sales but you have said that your company is worth $4 million. Obviously, there's a lot of future projections and showing your value. So how do you actually project and calculate and make sure that what your valuation of yourself makes sense to whoever's listening to your pitch? Right, yeah. So the with a lot of like you see it in the stock market, like tech companies and growth, a lot of it is based on like future value or expectations. Whereas with a D to C company, um, you can look online and do some research into what are common valuation trends or what would you expect for this. Um, and what, what we saw is our company is uh, po- uh, profitable. So we are, our EBITDA is really strong. Um, and typically, if you have about 20% EBITDA, that's like really strong and people will look at that really favorably. Um, and you'll see often things, it'll be a multiple on EBITDA. So it might be, say, your EBITDA this year is a million dollars of profit. Um, they might do, imagine, a 10 times EBITDA. So then your, your business is worth $10 million. So that's like a common one. You'll often see others do like a revenue multiple. Um, and at the time we went on Dragon's Den, we did a revenue multiple as well as EBITDA. So we had both of those numbers available. I forget what they were now, but uh, revenue was probably something like 2.5 times revenue. Um, and then EBITDA was, I, f- I forget what it would have been, but something that was kind of in the range of what is expected. So if you are selling, you are profitable, these things you can kind of find online and figure out what your valuation likely is close to. Um, and then other things that you can do in those pitches is you build up this multiple and this this valuation and you have to be able to obviously defend it in a very straightforward way. But also you should be thinking about the industry and the potential of the business. So say you've got your multiple at a certain point that you can defend really well for the investment fund or VC or whatever it is, they will look as well at the potential. So if you can grow... 10 more, 10 times more. Um, and they, and you can talk about how you can do that and how big the opportunity is. They will look at you even more favorably. Whereas if you're in an industry that sounds so niche and you can't explain how it's bigger than it is, it'll be much more difficult because they, they obviously want to invest and get a big return. So you have to show that, Hey, this isn't just like a $10 million company. Like here's how it can be a hundred million dollar company. Um, that's usually what, will get your pitch from interesting to really interesting. And I think going on a show like Dragon's Den or Shark Tank is very different from approaching investors is the fact that you are now telling your finances and your profit margins, your costs to the public, 
was there any nerves or hesitations around that? Because now your end users will know exactly how your finances break down. Yeah, it's it is challenging, especially on like a show, a show like that. Um, we we went into some of our finances, but there were certain things that we just we didn't want to expose, like on, on TV. So we figured out and practiced, of course, like the right ways to talk about these things. Um, because yeah, like I, I think talking about kind of if you're profitable and talking about that and how it all functions is is helpful, but. For instance, like I don't know if it makes sense to talk about like how much your unit costs are per product. Um, it's kind of a weird thing to talk about on Dragon's Den. I see it sometimes on Shark Tank because um, in the end, it's like manufacturing is always changing. It might fluctuate and change. Um, the key thing that we went with was we were early stages and we were profitable, um, but our greatest opportunity to like profit more was um, economies of scale and getting bigger manufacturing, larger quantities, that will, first off, it'll help us increase our margins, but also like for consumers, like we can get bigger everything and it's just better. And we can put that money towards new products and scaling the company. So anyways, it's it's one thing you, if you're going to go on a show like that, or even talk to investors, the wording you use and how you explain something is really important. Um, so I would constantly practice it. Um, whether it's just with your business partner or with family or friend or whoever it is, constantly talk about your pitch and how you do it. So when you go to your first one, you have it it pretty well solid and any objection you get, you can talk about, oh, actually, here's a, a reason why that's not the case or, oh, actually, that's a great point and here's what we're doing. You, you'll have these ready to go because, um, yeah, practice really does does go a long way because you're – your pitch won't sound very desirable if uh, it's what you think you want to hear, whereas investors might see it a, a different way entirely. And then also for the show, I mean, there's also like an entertainment aspect as well. You, know, you guys walked in and had you know different lines and talked about how you were like oil tycoons. There's fun puns. Uh, so did you guys actually prepare or um, that whole you know script or pitch, or did you get also help um, from producers of the show as well? With uh, with Dragons in particularly, and then I think Shark Tank's the same. What they tell you is um, you have about I think it's thirty seconds. So when you walk out, that first thirty seconds is extremely important. And typically, what you'll do is you'll make your script, and then you'll take it to your producer, and you'll say, "Here's what we're thinking, and here's what we're probably going to do." And they'll go, "Okay, yeah. Have you thought about this angle?" They'll kind of work you and make it better with you. Um, but that's it. Like they say. You have that first 30 seconds. And for TV, obviously, if you if you mess up, you can't just cut and do it again. Like, you have to get that right. So don't mess up your first 30 seconds. And we're like, okay, okay. So we practiced. We made our pitch in the 30 seconds. We did great on the show. The, the 30 seconds was fine. And then your producer says, so that's how much I help. Everything after that, you can ask me questions, whatever it is. But, like, it's your business. Like I can't, I'm not help. We can't help you in that point. So like you go on the show, you do the 30 seconds, hopefully you crush that. And then it's straight an hour and 30 minutes of actual questions. And I, I think many of them are like what you'd experience in a, in an actual room of investors I've, I've kind of chatted with and you get kind of the same, the same question. So you, you really do have to know what people are saying and what objections you'll get. Um, but yeah, that's the process. You, crush it. And then they just ask you as many questions as they can possibly think of about your business in, in great detail. What I want to mention is also you guys started this business as a side hustle and you guys both had full-time jobs. So a lot of the times when you're building this business in the early stages, you might be, you know, a lot more comfortable with experimenting because you're not relying on the business as your source of income. Um, now that you guys have, you know, moved full-time to look after the business, um, how has the shift for you been and what is different about your approach to finances now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's changed quite a bit. So now we're we're really in the business and excited by it. And with our last two years, not only are we obviously full time, but our view on potential 
has drastically changed. So if you see a business as, wow, I think this can be like a, a very large global company um, versus seeing it as like, oh, this, this could be a good hobby business or we could get it to this point. Whereas now we're in it every day and we could see the opportunity and the potential. We are so excited by that. So my view on what we can be has changed drastically for size and scale and how many products and assortment. Um, but also what comes with that and with what comes with investment is um, more pressure. So now I feel pressure with, we have employees. We've got people that rely on Bushbaum, not only for obviously a paycheck, but like we, we want them to be successful as well. So whether it's their career, if they can they can scale up at Bushbaum and grow and become kind of a leader in the company, or maybe they succeed at Bushbaum and then they move on somewhere else. Like now there's this new pressure of, Hey, people are relying on us, and let's let's do good by them. Um, but yeah, it's mostly been like as we've seen the opportunity ahead of us grow, so has our excitement for kind of running the business full time. Just because, yeah, we're we're ready to kind of get to that new new stage. Mm-hmm. What are some tools and resources that really helped you to understand finances revolving around employees now? Because there's payroll and there's other expenses in addition to just growing the business. Your banking partners are going to be pretty critical. And then we use QuickBooks for our accounting side, which has actually been really, really useful and smooth. And then I, I think we use a connection from Shopify called A2X, which uh, has worked really well with our accountant to kind of pull in all the information. Um, and then right now we're actually in the process of exploring some new uh, software for whether it's forecasting, we're in that kind of ballpark, um, whether it's cash flow or exploring more tools there. And then there's a few on like lifetime value, um, revenue, growth, products, growth. We're exploring more tools there. We're not quite landed on the the ones that we, we want for sure. Um, and then another one, which some people might not be comfortable with, is we've used ClearBank. At one point, we did a micro loan from them, which the only reason we did it was because we wanted to open up options for loans. So if we needed money quick, it was a good way to do it. We, we can't use Shopify capital uh, um, as we were employees at the time of Shopify, so we're technically not allowed. Um, so we use ClearBank, but ClearBank has this cool tool, they call it valuations. And you can actually check your valuation. Uh, and obviously it just pulls data and it tells you what it thinks it could be. But that was useful just to see where we, we stood. And uh, yeah, so if if you want to like go use a valuation tool, you could sign up and try it there. Um, and there's probably others that do a similar. It's just an algorithm that would tell you based on your spend and profitability, that kind of thing. So speaking of microloans, a lot of the times it comes with you know pivotal moments when you have a large order or a new retail partnership. Has there been moments where you were in a financial bind, and what did you guys do to kind of move past it? Yeah, in the early days, we were in one where we uh, had to personally put in money, um, which we put in close to $100,000 to do our biggest order in the early days to grow. So that was when our banking partners couldn't handle that growth. Um, whereas now, what? Uh, luckily, we haven't been in these binds where we, we are struggling to figure out where to get capital. Um, one thing I would recommend to anyone is the best time to raise money is when you don't need it. So... If you're at a point where things are going well and you don't actually need the money, um, think about finding the options to have it. So whether it's raising outside money or whether it's like working with your bank to increase your line of credit or whatever it is, just make sure to like get ready because you'll never know when something big is going to come. For instance, if we get a huge retail order, like now we know, okay, here's where we can get capital from. We've kind of worked through this, talked through it. Um, whereas if we didn't do that, we'd, we'd be scrambling to try to find the source for it. Um, so yeah, that's one thing I always recommend is just either build the relationship. So when you need to raise, you can quickly, um, or have tools in your back pocket. And that's kind of clear bank we used as a tool that we didn't think we'd use, but just in case something happened quickly, we could get a, a quick loan from them. Um, so yeah, having options is, is very helpful. Mm-hmm. And do you guys operate with a thinking of reserve funding and also having maintaining a minimal balance for comfort levels and things like that? Yeah, we do. Um, for us, a lot of it is in like we have a, li- a line of credit that uh, we don't tap in that, that much. Um, 
And the only times as like a business like ours and a lot of DTC businesses, you're very cyclical. So like buying inventory often goes up at one point, so your cash goes way down. And then as that inventory is depleted, your cash goes way up. So what we try to do is just spread out our buying habits to not be so demanding at certain times. Um, so that's one way. But as far as having like a budget at the top that we don't touch and keep, um, we typically will just have that there. And then ideally, if we don't have to tap into our line of credit, we don't tap in. So it, it becomes more of our buffer is that line of credit to be able to, I don't know, buy a lot of inventory. We often have that budget uh, available. And then if we don't use it, we don't use it. So now that you guys are now an eight figure business and you're looking for investors and you're pitching, um, how did you approach the aspect of searching for investors and like prepping for that process? Yeah. The, so the prepping actually is very similar to Dragon's Den is building. We, we have a pitch deck that we've been iterating on constantly. And as the opportunity gets bigger and we think it's larger, we've been changing it and adjusting it. So I'd recommend that to anyone is build your pitch deck and just have it as a document that always lives and gets better. So just it'll, you'll always need it. It'll always be helpful. Um, not only is it helpful for investors, it's helpful for just telling your good friend what your business is. Um, and then on the on the raising side, in an ideal investor, um, a bit of advice we've received. Um, so obviously, you're going to be, say, looking for an investor. There's a few things there. And then when you meet with certain investors, there are certain things to look for um, to see if it's a good fit for you. So for us, uh, in regards to investors, um, it, this is kind of a bad answer, but trying your best to network and meet people either through your network who know people um, or just finding the firms that have invested in other people in your industry and looking and maybe you reach out and you say, hey, we're not quite ready, but here's our business. We're keen to talk potentially in the future. Those intros will, will go a long way. Um, and then when you are looking for an investor, one thing you got to know is, first off, if you're doing like a friends and family round or whatever that looks like, and people are investing money in you, um, the more investors you have, the more you have to manage, the more people you have to worry about, talk to. And if someone's really demanding, that can be a drain on your time and effort. So that that's one thing to consider. Um, the other thing is if you're investing with, say, a VC firm, and um, they're going to have much more demands on you. Things are going to be, we want to see you grow by this much. We want to see this happen. We want to see this. Um, so you just have to know that and understand it and be ready for it. And obviously you'll you'll talk about it. Um, whereas if you're bootstrapped, you can grow at whatever rate you think you can grow at. There's less pressure um, to do something particularly or partner with someone or whatever it is. Um, so when you're evaluating the right investors is really think about who's a good fit and who has similar values to you. Um, and then, yeah, on the finding an investor side, there's lots of VCs out there. Um, but consider who you might know that can connect you with the right people to talk. Because, um, yeah, it's obviously not a good answer because not everyone can network in, in certain ways. But you got to try whether it's just sending a cold email to an investment fund with your business and your your pitch. Um, if you send a bunch of those, maybe you will get a couple meetings and then Maybe you'll scale quickly and those meetings will turn into the the investment that you actually that you do need. For sure. Thank you for all the insights. I think finances is such a daunting task, but it's important to talk about those things. Um, so if you were to give new business owners some advice when handling finances, what would they be? Yeah. So maybe just one piece of advice for anyone who's kind of running the financial side of their business or the marketing side even is monthly do a uh, profitability calculator. So just put in the numbers, the inputs, and have a template that you use every month and really look at, okay, how much per specific order are you profiting or losing? So if you can break it down that granular, what it means is you can say, okay, next month we can spend $10 more per order on marketing. Um, or you can say, oh, geez, we're really tight. Like we actually have to keep our customer acquisition costs really close to where it is. So if you can build that spreadsheet where you just plug in the numbers and you can do it every month, that's really helpful to to scale. Um, so especially on the financial side, because if you're if you're profitable, you can put more money into marketing or you can invest more in different places. Um, so getting down to the individual order level, how much you can you can make or not make is is pretty critical and. It's been a huge part of our, our success. 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much, David, for sharing your financial insights. Join us next time for another daunting topic. We're going to talk about failures next. Can't wait. (laughs) Awesome.